Yes, everyone, you know what time it is. It's your boys, Jack and Dave here, and we're going to be doing a fun tier list. Who doesn't love a tier maker? We're going to be going through all of the Don signings as well as Johan Lang signings. In today's video, we will look at Paratici and Johan Lang's signings since they arrived at the club and decide whether or not we have spent well, but we will also take into account who they were even signed for and what they have done since they've been signed. But Dave, let's get straight into this video, shall we? Because we have plenty of players to get through. Yeah, no, I'm excited, you know, while we're waiting for signings and twiddling our thumbs, I think it's a nice, quick, fun video to do. And as always, make sure you keep us to account in the comment section below. Let's go, Jack. I'm excited. And smash that like button for us. Maybe this is a, a kind of a palate cleanser for you guys. Take your minds off of the Slanky news and the Emerson news, all that good stuff. But let's get straight into it here. We're going to bring up on screen our tier maker. The categories that we have are incredible. I think that sort of speaks for itself. It's an incredible signing. The best that you can get a solid signing. I think there is some room for interpretation there, but probably more positives than there would be negatives. A poor signing. That's when you start to get a bit more negative about it. And then a flop. I think we all know what that is. That's one that just definitely did not work out and probably was a big waste of the money too early slash non-applicable this one is going to have some room for interpretation maybe guys that haven't had enough time to really prove themselves or in some cases there wasn't really that much information or that much evidence to really work off of to maybe make a conclusion about whether they were a good signing or not but this is going to be a good one to start with we're going to start off with the big vic now dave Vicario, I mean, he's someone that you and I have loved as the, the replacement for Hugo Lloris. He was signed for 15.8 million pounds from Empoli. We didn't know much about him at the time, but he was brought in as Tottenham's number one to replace the departing Hugo Lloris. Many at the time labeled him as a cheap option because of our pursuit of David Rea at the time. Cast your minds back to that time. And uh, he has been a great ball playing goalkeeper who in one season is already looking like one of the better goalkeepers in the Premier League, if I may add. I mean, Vicario. I'm going to get it started here, Dave. I think he's nothing short of an incredible signing. I was just going to say, Jack, we've got to start with the fireworks. It has to be incredible signing. He's been a revelation to come in and replace a guy um, who was a long outstanding servant for 10 or 11 years in, in the number one spot. And to a point now where people don't even miss him or even talk about him, it shows he's been an incredible signing. Yeah, I love the big Vic. And for 15.8 million pounds for a guy that no one even knew anything about, he really has been a revelation. And then we go on to another Italian goalkeeper, maybe less glamorous than uh, what Vicario ended up being, Pierluigi Gallini. He's someone who's been constantly ridiculed, you'd say, and uh, wasn't really looked at uh, very nicely by the fan base. It was a loan signing, right? I believe at the time from Atalanta, if I can remember correctly. And he was brought in as a low-cost type of loan option to provide some cover for our declining Hugo Lloris at the time. He made 10 appearances and was not bought at the end of his loan spell. So we saved ourselves uh, from having to uh, deal with any more Pierre Luigi Gallini debates. But Dave, I don't know with this one. I feel like it was probably for the most part a poor signing. Where would you put him? See, I look at this a little bit differently. At the time, we didn't have money to waste on a number two goalkeeper because we had so many other areas to address. So we, But we still needed to bring in cover because we knew Hugo Lloris was on the decline. And we didn't take up the option to take him on at the end of the summer. So I would say that I would argue either a solid signing or an NA because it is mm. one that we used just to get us by. And he'd done his job. He didn't really play all that much anyway, so I'd probably lean between the poor or the N.A., so I think Dave and I will probably just have to agree on an N.A. for Pierluigi Gallini, but I think that's already going to be a contentious one. Let us know if you disagree with us in the comments down below, please. We're going to move on to another goalkeeper that's been signed during this Paratici era, and that was Fraser Forster. Now, Dave, with Fraser Forster, he was a funny one, right? Because he was brought in as a free, as a replacement for Galini, as Tottenham's second-choice goalkeeper. He made 20 appearances the season that Lloris did end up quitting on the team in that Newcastle fixture. I think there were periods when Fraser Forster was actually quite well regarded by the fan base. Now he has maybe more of a mixed reputation, but the fact that he was a free signing and he ended up looking kind of better than Lloris did towards the end of the season, I might call this one a solid. I think I think for what everyone was expecting of him, no one was really expecting him to play any part, to be brutally honest. And in our hour of need, when Hugo Reese decided to quit, we only had one man to turn to. And I think he'd done well to come in and try his best to try and help steady that ship or at least, you know, make us a bit more better. And I think he did. I think you have to put it down as a solid sign. It was a free sign and he'd done what was asked of him. 
Yeah, I can't uh, disagree there, but we're now going to move on to another contentious one, maybe one that Dave and I did end up really defending to the hilt at this point in time. It definitely is starting to look like, sadly, one of the more negative signings. Brian Hill, of course, Brian Hill Messi, as we like to call him. He was a La Liga prospect when we signed him from Sevilla. Hill's Tottenham career never really got going, and he failed to impress under multiple managers and has since been loaned out twice, and his Tottenham career looks like it's practically over at this point. Dave, we defended him plenty. We know that there is a player in there. That if you were to look at his time as a Tottenham Hotspur player, it's pretty much nothing short of a flop. Yeah, I don't think there's any debate. I think it was hard done by that window when Dan June was brought in and he looked like it was just about to take off. But overall, he's been a massive flop considering we did give Lamella plus money for him. Yeah, it was Goodbye, was a my bit lover. Of... Goodbye, my friend. Was a bit of coin that we did spend up on Brian Hill. Maybe if uh, we didn't spend so much on him, I wonder if there would be a slightly different view mm-hmm. on that signing. Maybe there would have been more sympathy, perhaps, for him if it wasn't for his uh, much of a big fee. But let's go on to our uh, another option here. It looks like we have Jedi Spence. Now, this one I find difficult. Now, this is a guy who was signed from Middlesbrough at the time for twelve point five million pounds. Definitely was labeled as like a Levy type of signing since Antonio Conte's reign after a single breakout season while on loan at Nottingham Forest during their promotion season. It quickly became obvious that Spence was not Conte signing. Technically, this has been turned out to be a Levy signing that we found out later. But the Don will be the fall guy like he was at Juve. <laughs> However, it does look like a redemption arc could be on the cards here for Jedi, which complicates, I think, our decision here, Dave. I mean. This is weird. I might call it an NA. Too early. I maybe. think it's I think it's fair to call it an NA. Look, I know most people would probably put it down as a flop, but this was one that Daniel Levy did make, you know, even though uh, Conte did make it clear that he wanted an experienced right back in the door and he didn't play him and he was used as a as as a point to prove between him and the owner. Yeah. So I think this one will be half the one that we'll have to uh, reconvene next summer, Jack, and have a look at again. He's kind of used as like a political pawn in the uh, Antonio Conte, Daniel Levy wars at the time. So you have to sympathize for the guy. You have to, you know, kind of start to feel for him. So I guess we do put him in that NA category. Let us know if you disagree, but we're now going to be moving on to a wonderful player, in my opinion, Christian Romero. He was brought in from Atalanta slash Juventus. For 42.7 million pounds at the time. He was brought in as a prospect, and he definitely had some critics questioning his ability throughout his time at Spurs for his aggression, but has since, I think, silenced those critics, turning into practically a world class ball playing defensive player. You'd love your words, Dave, and maybe a bit of a shithousery from him. He's the ultimate off-ground defender and has turned into a real leader on the pitch for Tottenham Hotspur. He seems to love the club as well. This is one of my favorite signings that we've ever made. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm not even going to diminish him by justifying it. Just put him where he needs to go. Yeah, nothing short of incredible. Pat Matasar now, Dave. Another brilliant signing by the Don, if I may add. He was brought in the summer of 2021 and spent the following season on loan with Mets and used very sparingly by Antonio Conte, which left many doubting the signing in general. But since then... This all-action midfielder has been one of the most consistent midfielders last season for Ange Postacoglu and became a key player in Tottenham's future for the young uh, breakout stars that we have in uh, future campaigns. I mean, Pat Matasar, he is the star, Sar. I think we have to put him in as another incredible signing, considering the price as well. Mm, I, I think this is uh, one thing I'm not as Paratici has done well as identified young and since, you know, after giving time initially to get criticised and maybe a lot of sceptics around it, but given time, he ultimately, I think he has one of the best ideas for young talents and Papa Matasara's proof of that. I think for what we've signed and the more, and what we've signed since for big money, I think he was the most consistent last year. So I'll put that down as a solid or sorry, as a, an incredible. I think he's incredible because you also have to take into account the price, 15 million pounds for that kid. I mean, he's one of the most up and coming midfielders of his age group, and he has such unique attributes that are actually different from some of the other midfielders in our team. And uh, he ended up actually being a lot better in a sense, kind of sadly, than someone like an Oliver Skip, who is a very mm-hmm. highly rated player in the academy as well as in the team. And Pat Matasar actually ended up kind of showing him out as uh, being just a much better player. And uh, I think Pat Matasar is nothing short of incredible Lucas Bergvall, Dave, the guy who's competing for Madison's spot right now in the Tottenham midfield. You and I have shown him plenty of praise, but is it a little too early to uh, give him any sort of label? 
Look, I think the fair thing to be do would put him in the NA. However, I do think he's going to be a solid signing, or if not, incredible signing for the money we've paid for him. And I, I would argue, already shown in preseason, I think there's a lot that you can already take from him, probably Joe John. So I'm going to go early. I'm going to say solid right now, but could be moved to incredible next summer. Sounds like Dave already wants to call it an incredible signing, but he's just holding himself back a little bit. He's trying to be as balanced as he can on the subject of Bergball, which I appreciate. Let's go on, though, to another brilliant, brilliant signing. It feels very positive, but eventually we'll probably get into some more questionable ones. Destiny Udoji, who we signed from Udinese for 15.4 million pounds. He had an exceptional debut campaign under Postacago and has solved a long, outstanding problem defensively down our left-hand side. And most importantly... He got rid of Ben Davies on that left side at only an age of 21 years of age. I mean, he's just been a wonderful, wonderful player to watch. And I look forward to many more years with the Destiny Udoji. I think he's, again, another incredible signing. I think you have to put it down as incredible. He locked up that left-hand side for most of the last season. And, you know, he's, he came in and produced exactly what Spurs fans were screaming for. And if people remember the season before underneath Antonio Conte, which is when we actually signed him, we loaned him back for a season. But that left-hand side got tore apart week in, week out. It was a huge weakness. So I think you would put that down as an incredible signing, given the age and how many more years we have looking forward of this guy gracing us with his presence. Uh, destiny. He's uh, he's going to be the Spurs destiny, that's for sure. Now on to a guy that I have defended on plenty of occasions. You have defended on plenty of occasions, but he is a controversial one. It is Richarlison, the Brazilian. He was bought from Everton for around 49.5 million pounds. It was a big, big fee. And uh, it looks like, you know, he's kind of been marred by, like you say in the co- in the chat here, by injuries, off the field issues. He's not really stepped up on a consistent basis. He had a wonderful patch last season where he did start to kind of turn some uh, turn some eyebrows or raise some eyebrows, should I say. Um, but with Richarlison, this one's a hard one for me, Dave. I might, I'm not going to put it on a flop, but I wonder if it is sadly a poor signing because of maybe how things have just kind of worked out for yeah. Richarlison. What do you make? Look, first of all, I would say, Jack, is I think he had the hardest job in football last year, which was to replace Harry Kane. That's true. Um, That's true. It hasn't worked out, and it hasn't been because of football and reasons, which I think is quite sad. Look, right now, I think for the money we've paid and what we've seen over the course of two seasons since he signed, I think it would have to go as a flop right now. It's Mm. up to him, I think, to, to fire himself further up this tier list. Not even a poor. You think it goes as far as a flop? I think so. I think for the output that we've got over two seasons, you know, if if we were just ranking it off last season, I'd say, okay, maybe poor. But I think if we're taking it off the two seasons that he's been here, I would have to put it as a flop. Interesting. Yeah, and it was a big fee as well. Uh, You have to consider that. Uh, Rodrigo Bentoncourt, another brilliant one by the Don, if I may add. And also, I think a bit of it has to do with the price, right? I mean, what was this guy brought in for? 16.2 million pounds is what we have in our notes here. Someone argued that he was one of the best January signings of that season that Tottenham have even maybe ever made in terms of a January window. He came from Juventus, and he pretty much saved our top four chances. And he was an incredible midfielder alongside Pierre Hoiberg that year. Bentecourt, I think he's an incredible signing, especially considering the price. I think, you know, people might take into account his injuries and stuff like that. However, I think since he's come in here, I think he's been absolutely brilliant. And I, what I would say, I think he's been the benchmark on the levels of all of our midfielders since then that we've signed, that they shouldn't be any worse than him and they should be at least be able to do what, he's do, what he does. And I actually find him very graceful in that midfield. I think an incredible sign, especially since he came in and helped with that top four push massively. Yeah, and uh, he has that bit of je ne sais quoi, as Dave likes to say often, I think, in a midfielder. Dejan Kulisevsky, Dave, I mean, he's your man. He's the guy that you defend. You are the leader of the Kulisevsky army. How about you take this one? He was brought in from Juventus for 25.6 million pounds. We've signed him just permanently, I think, that last summer, paying it over installments. But what do you make of Dejan Kulisevsky? Where would you put him? Um, Look, for me, I'm a bit torn on this one, Jack, because I do want to sort of be fair, although I am a bit biased towards him slightly. But he did come in, he made an initial impact, almost people, you know, comparing him to Saka and saying that he was better. Now, since then, there has been large spells of inconsistency in terms of his performance, leading to some sections of the fan base maybe calling for for him to be sold this summer. 
However, we only signed him last summer on a permanent. I think he's going to be a key player for Tottenham in the future. He's only 24 years of age. Um, for me, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to put it down as a solid signing. Um, some people would say, Dave, if you're being fair, you'd put him down as a poor signing. But I'm going to stick to solid Jack. Yeah, I think Kulusevsky still has had plenty of good moments in a Spurs shirt. Yes, he had a maybe more disappointing kind of final year under an Antonio Conte, but I think he still was a very solid player for us. And that's what I probably, yeah, say. I already said it without even looking at the category. I think he has been solid. I wouldn't say he's been incredible yet, though, and he certainly could be at one point. The Emmer Goat, this is another one that is probably a very criticized signing by Paratici, who he's brought in for 21.3 million pounds from FC Barcelona. He signed on deadline day for Nuno Espirito Santo. It's probably failed to impress and win over the majority of the Spurs fan base. Some would argue that Tottenham bringing in another right side of defender to replace him is an admittance of them even getting it wrong in the first place, being Jed Spence, Pedro Porro. It's just always been clear that Spurs maybe haven't been that convinced by Emerson. Is it a poor signing or is it a flop? I think flop would be extremely harsh. I think you have to take into account who he, who he came in to displace. Doherty and Serge Aurier very successfully, may I add, despite many first Spurs fans having their concern about his ability. So I think he'd done a good job in that. I think it's too harsh to put him into a flop. Obviously, since we've signed Pedro Porro, it does, because of how good Pedro Porro is, it does highlight maybe where Emerson really needs to grow as a player to establish himself as one of them great right backs. But also, not to get lost in it, I think this guy has set a really good example to a lot of players in and around Tottenham that when things aren't going right, how you get out of it and how you respond to it. I would put him, and also, let's not forget, I think last season, a bar when he played left back, if he didn't play left back in them last few games, I think the narrative coming out at the end of the season would have been a lot different around him because I'd argue mm. he played better at centre back than Ben Davies. I thought he filled in at right back and didn't really cause us too much problems over there. It's only really when he went out at the left hand side where it, all the hysteria kicked up around him again. Look, I'm going to put him down as a poor sign, and I think that's fair. I think that's an in between between solid uh, and flop. But Jack, I'm going to give you the deciding vote on this one. Um, I think I'm going to put him in poor as well. I think preferably I would have just made a goat category and I just would have put <laughs> him there instead. But sadly, we just didn't think of that before recording this video. Yves Basuma brought in for a really good price, right? Something around like 27.8. Let me find like the notes that we have him down for 25, 25 million pounds from Brighton. He was actually labeled at the time, if I remember correctly, Dave, as like one of the signings of the season. That was actually by non-Spurs fans. They kind of saw it as one of the signings of the season. What do you make of the fact that maybe he's had kind of a mixed bag, I think, as a Spurs player? He's had a bad year under Antonio Conte where mm. he pretty much was ignored, wasn't used as often. Antonio Conte even questioned his kind of tactical understanding even of things. Uh, but then Antonio, or sorry, then Ange Postacoglu came in, gave him a new lease of life. He took advantage of it, had a wonderful mm. first 10 games, then had a bit of a mixed period. What do you make of Yves Basuma so far in a Spurs shirt? I think for the hype he's had and what he's delivered at Tottenham, I can find why many people would probably think, you know, he, he's been underwhelming. However, he has had a lot of change in terms of managers since his arrival. Conte, um, the what was his Ryan backup? Mason. Stellini, Ryan yeah. Mason, you know, Ange Postacoglu. For me, I think Ben is a guy that really thrives in a settled environment, but I still stand by. I think he was a massive coup at the time for Tottenham, and I think most Spurs fans would say that as well. I'm actually going to put him in a solid signing because I don't think he's been like an Emerson or a Gale or a Charleston where, you know, there's been a lot of skepticism around him and his ability and stuff. I think the conversations more around him is how do we drag more of that ability out of him? Yeah, that's a good distinction that you made there i'd also put him in a solid signing and you have to take into consideration the price like we didn't actually shell out too much money for mm. what was supposed to be one of the better midfielders actually in the premier league while he was still at brighton i think there still is that player in there and we have seen it come out at times pedro poro the postman the deliverer the porito i mean so many nicknames that we've had for this guy he's just mm. that incredible dave i think he has to be labeled as an incredible signing I think he has to look. There was a lot of sort of he was heavily criticized when he walked in here. Let's That's not forget right. about that. That he can't defend this, that, and the other. But since then, he's absolutely shut up his doubters. He's went back, he's worked on it over the last summer before last season, and he came back and he shut them up. But not only that, 
going forward last season, he was one of our most creative players statistically mm. over the course of the campaign. So I think it's been an absolute incredible signing. And it's 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 far from the days where we were under Aurier and Doherty, I can tell you that. So for me, it's got to be incredible. Yeah, and uh, it, during the times of, uh, you reminded us, yeah, of the fact that he was criticized at first and then kind of eventually started to silence the haters, which is always a great story arc. Mm-hmm. Clement Longley. This one is a fun one. Plenty of people absolutely hated this guy. And some people kind of think that they were being a bit harsh. It's a bit of a mixed bag here with Clement Longley. Mm -hmm. He was brought in on loan. We never really signed him permanently or anything like that. I mean, what did you make of Clement Longley's time in a Spurs shirt, Dave? Look, I think it was a bit of a mixed bag. Don't get me wrong. I think there was some some bad things. You know, the lack of pace was exposed maybe at times. But I also think he'd done a lot of good in terms of on the ball. You know, what it did do is it paved the way for the likes of Dyer and Sanchez to go and made them and rendered them, you know, inept in, in the many Tottenham's fans' eyes because of how good he was on the ball compared to them guys. Um, look, I... I would argue we're still sitting there, still looking for that backup left-sided centre-back. I did argue we should have signed him. I still argue, say, that we should still have him in here because he is good on the ball and can play out from the back and that. Um, I'm just trying to work out whether it's a genius signing or whether it was a poor signing or uh, Jack, or maybe a solid signing. And the reason why I say genius is because we didn't take up the option to buy him. Now, all that summer, we were rumoured to be in the market for a top sort of left-sided centre-back. We were a lot of people were very underwhelmed when they brought in Clement Langley. However, were they deferring it until they could get their hands on someone like Mickey Van de Ven, which eventually they replaced him with? So I'm actually secretly, ironically enough, I'm going to put it down as a solid sign, and I think it was a good go between until eventually we got our number one target. Wow, that's almost worth putting a thumbnail right now. Maybe putting uh, Clement Longley on the solid. I'm going to have to put him in the poor, and it's not really entirely Clement Longley's fault. I think I'm going to put it more on Daniel Levy's doorstep in this case, because we have long ranted since I've known you, Dave, about signing a new left-sided center back, you know, trying to push out guys like Eric Dyer, like Dobinson Sanchez, Ben Davies. And it just felt like that was another example of us not really pushing, you know, kind of uh, as far as we should have. Like, we desperately needed a, a Mickey Van de Ven during uh, Antonio Conte's era, and we still ended up, you know, kind of settling for a cheaper option like Longley. So I might actually put him in the poor category, not really all because it's his fault, more maybe a Daniel Levy kind of uh, element yeah. to it, if you kind of get what I mean by that. Yeah. It's just something that we needed kind of desperately for years, and uh, it still was a bit underwhelming, despite how much I think you and I did defend him at times. Mm-hmm. Arnout Dunjuma. Now this one, also kind of in the Daniel Levy, Antonio Conte sort of category, where you don't really know how much you want to blame the player. It's more kind of blaming the people that ended up signing him, I guess. Well, look, I think it's very important to know that at that time, Conte made it no secret. He wanted an experienced winger, uh, someone that he could use as an option over Brian Hill, despite Brian Hill having a good winter period that that winter. So you have to take into account that Conte did deliver to a degree what or Paratici did deliver to a degree what Conte asked for. So you have to put that context around this. But. It's not one that we knee-jerked and got locked into because obviously they had their doubts around Antonio Conte. So for the position that he was in when that signing was made, um, you could argue, again, solid signing, but I think that's a big push considering he only really made one Premier League start, scored, what, one goal in the Cup as well. Um, Yeah, I'm going to put it down. I'm going to put it down as a pour over what he contributed to Tottenham because it was only a loan sign and there was no fee attached. However... If you put it into context, what Paratici and the position he was in, some might argue maybe a decent or a solid go between until until we could, uh, you know, lock down our other targets. I would apply the same logic that it did a long way, where I don't really think it was much of the player's fault at the time. I and mean, he was only given so many chances as it is. It's just more a poor signing, maybe on the fault mm-hmm. of kind of the actual board and on the case of even just anybody that was involved in that transfer, Antonio Conte included, like you mentioned there, mm-hmm. who just ended up going with him instead of a Brian Hill. And I think he did face the repercussions of it, both uh, Antonio Conte as well as uh, uh, Arnaut Danjuma, sadly. Perisic, Mm. this is a funny one. I think we all thought this was going to be an incredible signing. Did he end up being an incredible signing, Dave? Um. Look, I actually think he had a fairly good input when he was here for that season. I think he was, what, one of our highest assisters, 14 or 15 yeah, assists yeah. that season. When you normally look at that, you would say, 
that's a good sort of campaign. <clears throat> I think where the problem comes in is that, how do I word it? You know, his injuries, his injuries came to fruition. You know, when he first arrived, he wasn't fully fit. It took him a while to get into the team. And then obviously the circumstances he left was off the back of a long-term injury. But for a guy to come in here in his early 30s towards the end of his career and adapt to the Premier League, I think overall he'd done a good job. And people need to remember, it was a go-between between before we could get Destiny Adoji in here because he played mm -hmm. left wing back for the majority of that season. So I'd actually put that one down as a solid signing. I think it is a solid signing. I wouldn't put it as far as incredible because I think some of us thought it was going to be incredible. And I think that there were times in certain games where Perisic was found a bit wanting defensively. He just couldn't mm. keep up with certain wingers. He did get exposed in one-on-ones and kind of wide areas, but he also made up for it with his output uh, going forward. And that was a pretty dismal season watching Spurs going forward. And he was one of our brighter sparks. So you have to give him that type of credit. I think that was good analysis from yourself there. Manor Solomon... Now, this is one I was really hyped on on the time because I'm a big Shakhtar Donetsk kind of a nerd. I would probably put it in that sort of term. It's a team I just always keep my eye on, always have a bit of a soft spot for. And Monter Solomon was one of their very talented players. We brought him in on that sort of controversial uh, kind of fee where there was really no fee. It was practically like a you know, a loan with no real, it's like a free signing basically, but he spent mm. most of the last season on the treatment table after suffering a knee injury in October after that Burnley performance. I just feel like Monar Solomon, the fact that he's now being touted to leave, sadly, maybe a poor signing. To be honest with you, I put it down as an NA. I think before he left, mm. he was starting to look like, or before he got his injured, he was starting to look like he was linking up a bit with Sonny. But, you know, really, we haven't really seen enough of him um, or over the course of the campaign, I think, to really judge him. The fact that he's on his way out, you know, could be that we're making way for somebody else. But look, I think when we all when we signed him, we have to realise it was more of an opportunist signing, knowing that, you know, we could bring him in for nothing, more or less, you know, just give Shaq our friendly and, you know, that that's all they're getting. And then we could maybe sell him off for potential profit in the future. So, you know, I, I think NA is more fair on that one. I'd, I'd say so too. I think that's actually quite balanced from yourself. Alejo Valise, Dave. This feels a bit too early, doesn't it? Yeah, way too early to judge. Look, it's clear, and we were told when we signed him, he's one that Tottenham identified for the future. So again, too early to judge. Yeah, he brought it for twelve point eight million pounds. Not even that much money at the end of the day. We'll just see and find out whether he will ever be uh, included in Spurs' plans. But there's still so much time to wait. Yeah, I don't think you can make your mind up yet. Ashley Phillips, I'd say Same. also too early, isn't it? Yeah, look, we brought him in. He, he garners a huge reputation for some of the appearances at Blackburn and in the England underage setup. But again, he's been brought in. He's been shipped out on loan. Looks like he's going to go out on loan again this season. So for me, again, NA. Yeah. And now this one, Dave. Now this is what we call a center back. Van de Ven, 34 million pounds from VFL Wolfsburg. VDV, he just wasn't brilliant from the get-go, right? He was brought in kind of late, one week before the season started, and was just pretty much thrusted straight into that first-team action and uh, just performed well from the get-go. He's just been an incredible, important player for Ange Postacoglu, as well as for this back line. One of the most incredible signings I've ever seen by Spurs. It's up there with Romero for one of my favorite signings yeah. of all time. The testament to a great player is how badly he's missed uh, when he's out and how badly the system crumbles when he's out. So that's all I got to say on him. Incredible signing. No, no, uh, definitely no short for words there. Uh, Timo Werner, Dave, Timo Weenie. This guy broke the internet when we signed him again <laughs> on loan. <laughs> what do you make of Timo yeah. Werner? I mean, this one's a funny one. Look, he's one that divides the fan base, I think. I don't think he's done anything to really people like in my camp really alleviate our fears of, you know, how clinical he is in that final third. Look, people in my camp would probably put him down as a poor signing. I don't think you could put him down as a flop because there's no fee attached to it. But there are people out there that, you know, don't believe like me, Jack, and they say, look, he's actually got decent stats. He's probably going to get better this season and might put him in as a solid signing considering there's no fee attached and he's helped out where we've lacked massive injuries and stuff. But for me, I'm going to stick by, I think, poor. 
this might be a bit odd for me to do this again. I would also apply slightly similar logic to the Arnap Denjuma, to the Clement Longley, where it's kind of just the stopgap type of filler type signing where mm. you don't really feel like it's that much of the player's fault. Like Timo Werner is only as good as Timo Werner will be. And he actually hasn't played terribly, you could argue, like in every game. There were some games where he did contribute and he did help us out in getting some wins. Kind of like what Clement Longley did, I would argue, where he did have some good games here and there and then hasn't really been brought in for an exceptional fee or anything like that. So I think you do just sort of leave it at a poor signing, but I don't think you can go much further than that. I'd agree with yeah. you there. Dragashin now, this one is interesting because he looks incredible. We just don't get to see too much of him because he sadly has to sit behind guys like Christian Romero as well as VDV. He turned down Bayern Munich to sign for Tottenham Hotspur, which already gets us bonus points. And he's shown glimpses of how good he can be. He's a monster physically. This guy could probably pick us both up and just throw us out the window with uh, one hand. Yeah. Dragashin, what do you make of him? I might start with solid, could eventually be incredible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Some would maybe say you could put him in NA that we haven't really mm. seen enough of him. But from what we have seen, you know, for his a few appearances last season and for Romania at the Euros over the summer, I think we'd all agree we've got a very solid signing there. And I'd argue probably the best third centre back in the Premier League as an option. Mm. So but again, could be one that could move up to incredible. I like that logic there. Archie Gray, too early, or can you already make a decision? It's a weird one because he's, we only really have preseason to judge him off, right? Yeah, you can take into account what he's done at Leeds, but you know, you can't really when we're make we're judging Paratici off this signing. Over preseason, we've shown that he's versatile and he's got a good football IQ that he can adapt to multiple positions. But when we've seen him in his natural position, you know, there's been a few things like his passing in the in the K League game, in Bayern Munich game, it looked like he was way out of his depth with the pressure that we're putting on. He couldn't even get on the ball that day. Um for me, look, I think there is an incredible player there. And I think in the long run, I think that he will go down as a solid or incredible signing. But right now, I probably goes against my logic for Bergval, but I think you'll put him in NA. Yeah, I think you just have to. It's also a much bigger fee than uh, Bergvall was. Bergvall, right, not even yeah. that much money at the end of the day. Whereas yeah, Archie yeah. Gray, he is eventually, he has plenty of time. He's so young, but he does have yeah. to eventually live up to that big fee that we did end up bringing him in for. So I'm going to leave it at too early or kind of NA as well. Vuskovic, now Dave, I think it would be obvious to put him in too early. Can you make the case that this guy is a solid signing and then eventually going to be an incredible signing because he's supposed to be one of the most talented center backs practically in his age group, if not within a few years of his age group. This kid is supposed to be the next big thing. We already look what he's done out on loan in Poland, you know, already how quickly he's took to the Belgian league. I think it's, I think anybody can see that we've signed an absolute incredible signing, you know, a, a physical specimen with a player that, Barring maybe injuries or something drastic, he has a big, big future ahead of him in football. Look, I'm going to go early. I'm going to put him down as a solid. Some people would say, look, Dave, you, you have to put him in as an NA, given your logic for Archie Gray and that. But uh, I'm just going to make a prediction on this one. I'm going early. So that's my logic behind this one. I'm going early as well. I like that you and I are thinking the same on this case. Josh Keeley, your Irish international, Dave, Irish brethren. I think he's supposed to be very talented, but he's kind of like Ashley Phillips. He's kind of like Alejo Valise. Mm. Just too early to tell. I mean, he hasn't had the opportunities, and it will be a while before he gets those opportunities. I would say he had a great impact at academy level when he came mm. in for the under 21s. It was a massive reason and you know, helping them get kick started, especially with the Ange ball playing out from the back, but also mm. being that solid presence. And we signed him from a relatively low fee from a club in Ireland that most people worldwide haven't even heard of. Uh, but look, I'm mm. going to be fair, put him in an NA. He hasn't made a first team appearance. Let's wait and see what he does. Interesting. But could become a solid one in the future. I liked some of that logic used there uh, in the fact that he's obviously been brought in for not very much money and he will eventually or at least should be a, a very talented goalkeeper. Mm. Will Lancashire, now, this kid had an incredible last year with the under-21s. You, of course, were witness to that. Can you make the case for a solid signing. I think of what he's done at academy level and the amount of goals he's scored and the recognition he's getting, I think, you know, you could put it down as a solid signing in terms of the way it's impacted the academy. What sort of future and what his future holds is relatively unknown at this point. But I think he's made a good case over preseason. I think from what we've seen at preseason, he has all the right attributes to go on and become 
a real top striker. Um, look, considering you know nobody heard of him before we signed him, and what he's done for the under twenty ones, you know, help him bring success. I'm going to put him down as a solid signing right now. If this was Daniel Levy doing this tier maker with us, I think he would put him as a solid because you have to look at it on a financial point as well. He is going to be sold for profit. This kid is very talented. He's very wanted around Europe as well, not even just the Premier League or, you know, other teams in the English pyramid. This kid could end up, you know, getting some interest from like a Dortmund or something at some point, mm -hmm. right, in his career. So I say he is going to eventually be sold for profit, even if he doesn't end up making it at Spurs. So I think you just have to look at it as a solid uh, signing for that reason. There is going to be pure profit from it. Judson yeah. Sepbell, the guy I really liked watching for the under 21s with you. I really liked his look, his style mm. of play. He's left-footed and right-footed. He's very ambidextrous, I feel like, with the way he uh, kind of dribbles at players, shoots as well, tall, looks like he's going to be a good footballer, but he hasn't broke through into the team like maybe others seem to. Yeah. Look, you know, uh, he initially had a great start to the campaign. In the last half of the campaign, he was playing through injury and really failed to hit the heights that he had hit when we were watching him or when you were watching him at the start of the campaign, Jack. Um, look, didn't go on preseason tour this summer. Went with the under-21. So right now, I think probably too early to, early to judge. Again, very little fee attached to it. So we'll put it as an NA. Yeah, uh, we'll find out with Jun Sun Sep Bell. Great name to say, let's be honest, though. Mm. Uh, Young Min Hook, another great name to say. <laughs> Love that kid. And uh, he did sp uh, spin Emerson. He looks talented, but let's be honest. I mean, way too early to tell with this guy. Way too early to tell. I would argue, if you looked at it from a commercial perspective, it would mm. go down as an incredible signing. <laughs> uh, however, we judged them on their, uh, what they've done for Tottenham or what they could do for Tottenham. And right now we'll put it down as an NA. Sadly, we couldn't get Daniel Levy on this one, guys. So uh, he couldn't give his opinion on it. Maybe Davis right. He probably would put him out there. <laughs> incredible. <laughs> now, two guys that if you're still watching at this point in the video, James Madison and Brennan Johnson. We'll end off with uh, Big Brennan, but we'll start with Jamesy here. Brought in for a big fee. Let's remind ourselves of that. What was it, Dave? I'm trying to find in our notes here. What was that fee? Uh, Jeez, for I think James? it's 40 million. Yeah, I'll tell you now. And it 39.5 million. 39.5 million. And he was brought in as to be the Christian Eriksen replacement. To a degree, also partly brought in to be kind of like half of Harry Kane's replacement. Like he was supposed mm. to replace the creative side of Harry Kane's game. He also was wearing the number 10, the big glamorous number 10 shirt. Hard to say with this one. I'm not going to go, mm, Dave, what do I do here? I just, is he Look, solid? That's hard to say. Like, that feels generous to put him in solid. Some would say put him in flop with what we've seen the back end of last season and preseason. However, this is a signing that did get many Spurs fans' juices flowing at the time. He got off to an incredible start to his Tottenham career. He got injured and never really came back to that sort of level. So we've seen the good and we've seen the bad of James Madison going forward. Too early. I maybe. think he probably will contribute more than than. Uh, I think he will contribute more. We had to have a season of him. I don't think you can put him in any. Look, I would be borderline putting him in poor now. With an intent, you know, with a view of uh, him becoming solid, but some people would say, you know, you put him in solid and he could become incredible. I'm gonna leave this item up to you, though, Jack. I'm gonna leave him at solid, but he's dangerously close to poor, especially I think if Bergvall does end up kind of playing more than him this upcoming mm. season, and if Madison doesn't live up to the heights that he was supposed to. I don't think he has yet. I don't think he has at all reached that uh, fee of uh, 39.5 million pounds and to be the number 10 for Tottenham Hotspur, right? A very big position. I just mm. don't think he's lived up to that expectation yet. He could this upcoming season, but we don't know yet. So I say we leave it at solid and we'll come back to this one later. Now, Brennan Johnson. <laughs> this one's going to be fun as well. If you're still listening, let us know if you don't already hate us at this point in the video. 47 million pounds brought from Nottingham Forest. He has split the fan base indeed since his arrival, and the consistency of his end product is constantly being brought to light. The big question is, can he develop and can he become even better, or have we bought an expensive flop? You look at the stats from last season, they're pretty solid, but the seeing eye test also tells you something different. At least that's the case mm. with Dave or I, because he was a frustrating player, at least for us personally, when we were watching all those games. I think it's a similar thing with James Madison. It's like this upcoming season 
is going to be the deciding factor. Look, I think this upcoming season probably will be the telltale test, but look, I, I'm not one. I don't like to attach her, attach the fee to Brennan Johnson because we all know the mm. market, you know, the, the stuff. And I think it's hard to attach that fee to him. He doesn't decide what fee he goes for. However, I find him to be an extremely poor bang average player. And I would actually go early and call him an expensive flop. However, most people will probably say, Dave, that's too extreme, put him in poor. But then you will have a lot of the fan base saying, Dave, you got to put him in solid. You know, his stats are good <laughs> for the first season. Um, I would personally put him in flop. But Jack, again, you're in control of the mouse. Where do you want to put him? I said the logic I used with James Madison, I think certainly applies to Brennan Johnson here. And someone did say, how does James Madison get away with less criticism than Brennan Johnson? Brennan Johnson, at the end of the day, actually had better output at the end of the season than even James Madison did, despite our frustrations with the player. We were frustrated with both players. I'm so going to leave them. Jeez, man. <laughs> this, this is, leave it out of the to decide. Maybe, yeah. We'll just leave him an incredible next, or not incredible. Jeez, not that. Um, we'll leave him at solid. And because what I find funny oh, about Brandon Johnson, you could find people who would label it an incredible signing. You'll find people who would find it a solid signing. You could find people who call it a poor, and you could call people that would find it a yeah. flop, and maybe also others that would give it a too early uh, to yeah. tell with Brandon Johnson. He is all of the above. He is the full rainbow in this situation. I'm just going to leave him at solid. You let us know in the comments, everybody. You're probably even surprised how Dave and I haven't absolutely torn through him. Like maybe we have some of the watch logs here. I think Dave and I must be pretty nice today, uh, but we'll leave it there, everybody. Thanks for watching back this video. Thanks for watching back this uh, tier maker. They're fun to make. I look forward to making others at probably the end of the season and plenty more throughout this season. Um, but Dave, any final words from yourself here? Yeah, I'd like to sign a disclaimer. Madison and Johnson being in solid, I have absolutely <laughs> nothing to do with. I've made my voice clear on that. Uh, but no, honestly, guys, just a bit of fun, you know, amongst all the hysteria around the transfer yeah. window. Don't take it too seriously, uh, you know, but of course, give us your opinions or give us your own tier list in the comment section below. And make sure you smash that like and make sure you tune in for the pre-match build-up for our last preseason game against Bar Munich tomorrow. Just a Friday video for you guys to enjoy and take your minds off of all the transfer craziness that's going on right now and all the frustrations. Hopefully you guys appreciated it. A little palate cleanser, like I called it before. Smash a like Don on the way out. Or con. <laughs> is the Don uh, or is he a con? Fabio Paratici and Johan Langa signing starting to come into uh, the question here with uh, maybe him starting to be questioned by the fan base. But we'll leave you there, everybody. Come on, you Spurs. In the Don we trust, maybe this time. We've always trusted in him, Mr. Fabio. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Everywhere we go.